You're muted, Johnny. Just wanted to wait for the lady to say her thing so we can get started. Um, we all know the recording's in progress. Good morning, everybody. Good to be with you. Good to see all your lovely faces. Um, I, 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 mean, I enjoy being with everybody in person. It's great, but I know that not everybody could make it and different times and for different reasons. So Zoom does provide us the, 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 the opportunity to still see, be able to see each other. And um, thankful for that. Uh, I want to start us off with uh, with prayer as uh, as I get ready to share with you this morning, um, and as I'm sure you had some good good time of discussing uh, the questions. So let's uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your uh, your word that you give to us, Lord. And there's so much there. There's there's wisdom and poetry, and there's stories and history, and there's um, there's images and there's prophecy and there's so much. And as we've been going through Acts, Lord, um, we get to just read these amazing stories, the, the amazing journey of uh, Paul and people who are dedicated to, to serving you and proclaiming the gospel and giving their lives. Lord, and there's so much to be thankful for in these stories, but there's also so much that we learn. There's, there's so many opportunities for us to be convicted, so many opportunities for us to, um, to have our faith Kind of pushed or, or challenged, um, Lord. I pray this morning that you would uh, open the eyes of our hearts, that you would wake us up in places where we are asleep, or shake us up in places where we may be comfortable, Lord, and allow us to see what it is that you're calling us to. How we can continue to grow in our relationship with you and in our uh, our calling as followers of Jesus Christ, and what that means, even in the places where it's hard. We give this time to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Amen. Okay. Well, um, last week, Molly preached powerfully about the, the critical importance of creating and maintaining a sense of deep community with others, and particularly in the church, among people who are following Christ. I mean, it, it is important. I will say it is important for us to to create community with people who are not yet in the family of God, who don't yet know Christ, um, because they need to know that they're that they that they belong, that that you know that that the family of God is for them. Um, but she talked about this, you know, this story in Acts twenty where Paul is in Ephesus, um, and and there's this this deep time of 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 mourning, but also just being together as a family, and he he really he's certain he's not going to see his fellow Christians there again and I, I you would try to just trying to imagine what that's like to to have someone that you so dearly love god use this this person to to change your life and you know this is likely going to be the last time you, you see them and and so we talked about that 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 depth of community um and it was it was cool um because we talked about that that community that sense of building community and, and what does it take to to have a community of people where you get to a point like this and you're actually crying over each other. You're actually weeping together, but you're celebrating everything that God has done in your life. And, and but it, but that takes time. Right. And we, and many of us have that together. Right. And the reason we have that together is because we've been through stuff together. Like we've been through the ups and downs of life together. We've, we've mourned deaths together. We've been through serious illnesses together. We've, many of us have walked with each other through marital crises, through financial crises, through, medical crises. I mean, we've seen each other through, I mean, relational things. I mean, we've seen each other through things, right? So when you go through things like this with people, and, and in the, in this case, in, in this, in this community of faith, what does that do, right? That really binds you together. And so, so when it comes to a point where it's time for us to split off, or even where it's, I'm, I mean, I'm not, we're going to lose this person, this person is going to pass away. That does create a, a deep sorrow, but also that's this deep sense of of, of joy and celebration because you, re you recognize that you've shared something really special and you can't just you can't just make that happen out of the air so what was cool is that we talked about this and then immediately after after the church was done many of us had the opportunity to go and help our friends amy and anthony juan garcia go and move their house and they're moving from their house in monterey park over to a house in whittier um, and and now thankfully they're all moved in safely there but there you see an actual this was a foot picture that we actually took of there's abner there on the truck and jesse's you know taking a box from him dressed in their uh, super mario coveralls but 
Um, no, I'm, I'm totally kidding. This is, I, I could, we, so we were so caught up with moving and it was so ridiculously hot. And I think we were all just trying to get it over with. <laughs> Uh, Abner, Abner almost, you know, Abner had an asthma attack. I mean, it was, it was craziness, but, but here was, here's what was really beautiful. Oh, yeah. Abner was, Abner was, it was pretty serious for Abner, but here's what was really, was really beautiful. So, so we were out there, you know, sweating and just doing the work. And there were people that showed up early, you know, early as some of Amy and Anthony's friends, family showed up earlier while we were still doing church to help move them. Uh, Michael Chang was out there early. Yeah, it was serious. It had to have been around hundred degrees. Um, so when we were all done moving things and there was one last load that had to be taken and I got there late and I didn't even, I ended up you know, going there and didn't even move anything. But the cool thing was, is that Molly, Jesse, Tammy, uh, uh, and, and Amy and Anthony and myself, we, we all just took a break. We sat in the back yard in their patio, that this beautiful backyard patio um, now. And we just sat there and we just talked. Amy updated us on a, this really, really uh, powerful trip that she just taken, an educational trip that she had taken. And we're, I, I'd love to hear more about that. And we just talked about that, about their, their lives and what's happening. And, and then we ended that time, we just prayed over them. We prayed over them. We prayed over their, their new place of living. We prayed that it would be a place of blessing for them and the people that they invite in their homes. And it was beautiful. You know, but that, that time all came about from this building of, right, of this community. So I uh, just, I think of that as an example of, of really living that out, but it, it, that's not always easy, right? It, there's a lot of work. There's a lot of like struggle sometimes, and then you get to enjoy these beautiful times of rest and, and, and fellowship. And, um, and it's, that, that's a really beautiful part of this community of faith, um, being in a, in a place where you're in this family. And then this past week, um, or this morning, if you were in life group, our life groups, they studied the, the first part of Acts 21, um, where, where Paul is traveling around and he's with his entourage. And, um, and uh, he, you know, he, he get, they get approached by this prophet named Agabus, right? And uh, Agabus, uh, it, it, he, uh, you know, he, he, he uh, ties, he picks up a belt and he says, whoever owns this, it's going to happen like this. And he ties his, his own hands and his feet. I don't actually know how he tied his own hands and his feet. But anyway, um, he said in this way, this is going to happen. The Jews in Jerusalem are going to tie up the person who owns his belt. And it was Paul's belt. And basically just saying, Paul, if, if you go to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen. Right. He had already he had already heard before from other people by the spirit. They said, this is what's going to happen. And if you go to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen. And so all along the way, he's had people telling him, this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to be bound. <clears throat> this is going to, to lead kind of to the beginning of the end for you. Um, but, but, you know, you, it's, it's not, it's not going to end well for you there. You're going to have some more suffering and persecution. Can you imagine being part of Paul's entourage, part of his team? I mean, it would be so inspiring. It would be so inspiring to travel with somebody who was so locked into God's will to even say, I know what's going to happen to me. I, I want to suffer for the sake of Christ, for the sake of the gospel. It would have been so inspiring to be part of it, but also maybe a little bit scary because, you know, you're part of his entourage. So how do you know that what happens to him is not going to happen to you? How do you know that whatever he goes through, it's going to, it's going to end up happening to you? And you're, are you willing to give that sacrifice? You're not just part of his entourage. You're actually associated with him. And anything that happens to him can happen to you. And also sad, because like I said, you, you know this person, you care for them. This person has cared for you. He's invested time and has made sacrifices to preach the gospel. And <clears throat> many of these people are, are Christians because of the work that Paul has done. So how do, you, how do you just let Paul just go into this, right? If you were, if you were one of these people, don't you, don't you think that you probably would have tried to convince him? Um, you know, after Agabus talks to him, it says the believers, uh, the believers there in, in Caesarea and his team, it says we, all of us, tried to, uh, tried, tried to uh, convince him, you know, don't go. What, what would you say to somebody like that? I imagine, you know, I know there, there are people right now, I even, I even met a, a missionary a couple of weeks ago when we were doing our, our retreat with this Korean church um, that they invited us to go do worship. And there's this this guy who has an amazing story. I, I think I'd love to, to have you hear his story sometime, but amazing story. He used to be homeless and, and he, he, you know, drugs and that kind of thing and mental illness and demons and all this kind of stuff. And now he's, he's been completely transformed and he's out there preaching, doing revivals and, and, uh, and, and is leading people to Christ. And he has a special heart for home, homeless people and people who are suffering mental illness and drugs and all that kind of stuff. 
but he says, you know, like he's one of those people that like, I don't, I, I, I'm not afraid to die. And he says, I've, I've thought about, you know, just going to North Korea and just walking in so I can have a chance to preach to the guards. And, you know, on the one hand, I respect him. And on the other hand, I can imagine if I was somebody close to him in his ear, I'd be telling him like, don't you know how much more effective you could be if you didn't walk into North Korea and just get yourself killed immediately? You know, like I, I imagine a lot of Paul's entourage were telling him things like this. Like, don't you know how much more time you can have preaching the gospel? Look how effective you've been. Look how many people have thousands and thousands of people have come to know the Lord because of you. Why would you do, why would you just walk yourself into what you know is going to be, you know, um, the beginning of the end for you or, or, or getting arrested? Like, why would, why would you do that? Um, how could you not? How could you not say something like that to somebody that you care about? He tells them, stop crying. Stop, why are you breaking my heart? Because of course he cares about them. And of course it hurts him to see people that he's, that he loves hurting, but he knows what he has to do. It reminds me of, you know, when I was leaving Korea this last time when we went to visit my wife's family, with Gloria's family, and I had to leave early and they were going to be there for another two weeks without me. And I knew why I had to leave. You know, I needed to go work. I needed to go help oversee our business. And my kids just, they didn't get it. You know, they were like, daddy, why can't you stay? Daddy, why can't you stay? And the day that I was at the airport, they were just, you could tell in their faces, they were all just sick to their stomach. They were sad. You know, they're, they're sad that I had to leave and that they were going to see me for two weeks and they were crying and they were crying. And, you know, I remember walking well, I said, I said my goodbyes. I hugged them really quick, you know, because there was tears in my eyes too, just seeing them cry like that. I was like, why are you breaking my heart? Like, just let me go. You know, stop crying. You're making it harder for me. I know why I have to go. I'm an adult. I've, I've got to work, but why are you doing this? <clears throat> so imagine what it's like for Paul, knowing that it's not just, I'm not going to see you for two weeks. It's, this is it. And I'm, I'm going to go and, uh, you know, meet me, likely going to meet my end. So just briefly, just, just so we can get a, a context of why, why does Paul feel so strongly that he needs to go to Jerusalem? Why does he need to go to Jerusalem? What, what is, why does he need to go there if he knows what's going to happen? And again, you see someone you care about going down a path that's going to lead to possible destruction. What would you do? What would you say to them? Um, but but here, here's a, primarily the two reasons why Paul's going. One is that he knows being arrested will lead to more opportunities to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by being arrested uh, by the Jews, it means he possibly can preach to the Jews. As a Jew, as a former religious leader, he understands that the Jews were God's chosen people, chosen to bring forth the Messiah, um, Jesus Christ, and chosen to be the ones to bring forth the good news. So he, he knows that it's going to create a unique opportunity for him to pre preach to the Jews. And, so he, and, and he's not just like, I'm going to be in prison. I'm just going to sit there moping the whole time and like sad and just trying to get out. If he gets arrested, he knows he's going to use that opportunity to preach. The gospel and he's going to take every opportunity he can before this he spent all these times in these years traveling around preaching to the gentiles and now he has he's going to have this other unique opportunity to preach in a different way but secondly and more practically he has been he has been uh carrying around uh a, a gift for the church in jerusalem he's been collecting gifts uh, the financial gifts from the other Gentile cities that he's been visiting. And th this was important because it was probably harder for Christians in Jerusalem to receive this kind of financial support because they were being persecuted more and people were watching what the Christians in Jerusalem were doing. But, but also, he, it was so important for him. It was so important for him to present this gift to the Jewish Jerusalem Christians from these Gentile Christians in these other cities because he wanted to show that there was solidarity and unity between the Christians. He wanted the, the Jerusalem Christians to know that their Gentile believing brothers and sisters cared for them so much that they wanted to send these gifts for them. If you've ever read like in Ephesians where he talks about, right, we are, he, he, made, he made us a new people that the, the dividing wall of hostility has been torn down. Paul really cared about this, right? Before he, it was just the Jews for him. And then God really opened up and said like, no, the Gentiles too. And, and it was like, we've got, we have to reach everybody. And, but now he realizes that there's this divide division between Jews and Gentiles. He writes about this a lot. And so he, it's so important for him to, for the Jewish, Gen, the Jewish Christians to know that the Gentiles love them, that they are brothers and sisters, that they're one, that they're united. So think about this. He, it's, a, it's that important to him that he's willing to go back to Jerusalem knowing what's going to happen to him so that he can deliver this gift. He is, he is planting seeds. He is, he is doing for the church something that he will likely never get to see fully lived out. 
right? He's taking this gift to the Jerusalem Christians, and there that is going to be as a sign for them that the Gentile church is united with them. And, and this is going to create connections and relationships and solidarity and unity that, that that's going to that's going to come to fruition down the road and he won't ever get to see it because he's going to be going through his own thing he's going to be on trial and then and eventually you know executed down the road and that's going to be late, later on you'll hear about that in acts but he's doing this for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the church in ways that he'll never get to experience himself so let's, let's read what happens to, in our today's passage. Now that we know all of this that's been going on, he gets to Jerusalem, and this is what happens. In the first part, it says, when we arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers welcomed us warmly. The next day, Paul went with us to visit James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard it, they praised God, and they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands of believers are among the Jews, and they are all zealous for the law. They have all been told about you that you teach all the Jews living among the Gentiles to forsake Moses and that you tell them not to circumcise their children or observe the customs. What is to be done? What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Paul, you are in trouble. Okay, so let's let's go back. Let's just look at what's happening first in this first section. I just want because I want to set it up to help us understand what's really happening. This is one of those passages. I was telling the, the leaders when we were gathering to pray in the beginning. This is kind of like watching one of the recent uh, Marvel, you know, Marvel superhero movies like uh, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness or something, where if you haven't watched like the previous 20 movies that have happened in this series, then you'll have no idea what's happening. And it's like, what, who is, what, wait, what is, what are you even talking about? You don't even know what's going on. You had to have gone back and watched all these first. So this, that's why I, I did all this setup at the beginning to, to kind of show you how we got to where we are now. Paul's in Jerusalem. I wanted you to know why is he in Jerusalem? Why is it so important for him to be there? But now he's there and you see that he goes, to, he goes before the elders, right? He's, and it says James, right? And, it, and I don't know if you remember previously um, in, in chapters before, we heard that uh, James actually uh, died. Um, he was executed. And so what is this James back from the dead? Is it zombie James? What's going on? Like, you know, this is a different James, right? A lot of people believe that that James was the, the, the brother of, uh, of John and uh, he was one of the, uh, the disciples, um, and he was executed, so they, they believe that this was James, the, the half-brother, the brother of Jesus. Um, what I think is interesting, though, is that I think we often will hear about Peter being the, you know, the kind of the, the leader of the church at this time. We don't see Peter here. He's not named, but it looks like, you know, they, they mentioned James as the, as kind of the leader here, and it says, and all the elders were present, and so after greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. This reminds me, and any of you who have ever been in ministry, I'm sure Abner and Molly, in your time within a varsity, you've done this. Uh, I did this a lot in my time as, as pastor, especially back when I was with Trinity. I, it reminds me of when I would go on a mission trip with the youth, you know, and we would, it, we, we would did all this fundraising. It was, it was and Those of you who were there, you remember that, You'd fundraising, we do bake sales, we you know, the, the youth would offer to mow people's lawns and all this kind of stuff. And we'd build it up and we'd, and I would spend hours and hours on the phone with parents trying to convince their kids, trying to convince them to let their kids go on these mission trips. Cause they're like, you're going to Mexico and I don't want my kids to die. And you know, what's going to happen to them there. And I'm like, no, it's going to be fine. They're going to be taken care of. They'll be well fed. Um, they'll, we'll make sure that they, they, they clean themselves once in a while. It's going to be great. You don't need to worry about it. It's great. And so we do all of this buildup and then we spend, you know, a week or so in, in Mexico and we do all this work and, and the kids come back and they're crying and because you know, they had such a great time and they have these, they have these beautiful, yep, Cheryl is one of those parents, right? She remembers. We have these beautiful times, you know, candlelight service and the kids are crying and they're praying and they're experiencing God in a way they never have before. And, and we, had some we had some crazy experiences there in, in Mexico where kids were like experiencing God's love and it was powerful. So then you come back from that, right? And the board wants to know, what did we spend all that money for? <laughs> you know, what did we do all that for? Give us a report. What have you been doing this whole time? We've sent you out. You did, we're doing all this. What happened? Tell us what happened. It kind of reminds me of that. And Paul is telling them one by one. Oh, and then this happened. Oh, and then there was this amazing thing that happened over here in this city. Oh, there was this amazing thing that this person that, you know, that uh, I thought this person was never going to, you know, turn from their ways. But, oh, and then we encountered this. And so just telling all of the stories of what, what happened. And it was, it was, I'm sure it was beautiful. And, the, <clears throat> and so the elders, 
Of course they're thankful. Of course they're thankful. And they don't want to, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to rain on Paul's parade coming back here, but they said, that's so great. Paul, this is so wonderful. Um, tens of thousands or, you know, thousands and thousands of people, multitudes of people uh, coming to Christ because of what you have, what, what you've been doing and your, your boldness in the gospel, many thousands of Jewish believers. And, and here's the thing, Paul, the, the elders have to kind of bring it down. They're like, okay, look, listen, we're really great for all of this, but listen, how many thousands of believers there are among the Jews and they're all zealous for the law, right? They, they believers, they, they have, they have trusted in Jesus Christ. They, they, they believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but they, they are also Jewish. So these Jewish Christians, they, they follow this law um, and they believe that this is how they can still remain right with, with God and they continue to please God. They're sincere, right? So they, they believe in Jesus Christ, but they are also, they want, they, they're still good Jews. They, they still want to be good Jews. They're sincere in their commitment to the Jewish law. So uh, Jesus himself, and, and, you know, we don't know how much, how much they know about this, right? But Jesus himself said he didn't come to abolish the law, right? It, it wasn't his goal. His goal was not to abolish the law, but that, if you remember this passage, what did he say? I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law and the prophets. That was very important for the Jews, right? Everything that the law had said um, and, and Moses, right, delivered the law to the people. And that was their law. That was their way that they could please God and remain in right relationship with God. And, and Jesus came and Jesus himself, right, was very careful to say, I did not come to abolish. My, my goal is not to say that doesn't matter and it's dumb and you know just you know you can just rip it up and you don't care about it anymore i have come to fulfill the law and the prophets so their belief in jesus christ as fulfillment of the law made them it seemed like it made them even more excited about following the law because it's like okay we don't we don't need to follow the law but we're going to do this because we are jews and and we do this as a way to continue to please god but but we recognize that jesus you know, Jesus Christ has fulfilled the law. So they, so they hear about this Paul, right? And, and think about it, church. You, you know, if you've been a Christian for a long time, you know that there are certain traditions in church, right? Where it's, it's like, look, uh, I, I know that these things don't save me. These things don't necessarily make me a better Christian than someone else, but these things are really important for me. In, in fact, I need these things. I need to have these certain elements of worship or certain elements that need to be in church right? Um, yeah. In order for, for me to really feel like I'm connecting with, with my faith and, and that I'm growing and that, that I'm able to, to be edified and encouraged and built up, lifted up in, in my spirit. I need these things, right? Does anybody relate to that? When you feel like when I come to church, I need to have this. When, I'm, when I want to engage in my faith, I feel like I need to have this, right? I, I need somebody preaching the word, right? I need somebody who's there, like just pre, I, I don't want to just, I don't want to just, uh, you know, just put on a, I just don't just put on a YouTube video of Rick Warren or something like that. Like, come on, pre like somebody, somebody do some work and preach, right? Um, like, like preach. I need that. Or some of you may feel like, you know, when I come to church, I, I want to sing together. I, I need, I need some, I need to hear some songs that are uplifting. Somebody came to me and told me last week, one of the songs I sang that they had heard it before, but they'd never quite heard it that way. And it really spoke to their heart. Some of us really feel like we need that, right? Like, like let's, let's spend some time in worship and like, let the Lord touch my heart and, so, so we can relate to this, right? Where it's like, we know those things don't save us. We know those things are not like, you know, if we don't have those things, our faith is going to just crumble and fall. But like, hey, I, I, this is important to me. This is important to my faith and, and expressing my faith. So you can, you can relate to these Jewish Christians who are like, the, the law still matters. I, I still want to follow these, these customs. So imagine they hear about this Paul, a Jew and a former Pharisee, who's preaching that, that they are saved by grace. And that the customs of the law are not required for Jewish living among the Gentiles. So he's actually going to these places and telling Jews who are living on Gentiles, you don't, you don't have to do these things, right? He's been going around to these other countries where there are Gentiles and, and some Jews living among the Gentiles. He's been teaching them that, yes, follow the law if that's your conviction. But that is not what saves you. 
right? What does he write? Does anybody remember in Ephesians 2, what he says, for it is by what that you've been saved? It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. See, Paul did not want anyone to think that they could be saved by anything other than the grace of God displayed by Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross. He, this was important for him to, to help them understand this is how they were saved. It was not through obeying and following the law. So Paul would travel around the world. He would find, or the, the world at that time, find that these laws were too much for non-believers, for non-Jews. Maybe the heaviness of the law, the customs, was actually prohibiting non-Jews from coming to faith in Jesus Christ. So he preached over and over and over again that the law is not what saves. There is a new covenant, one that does not forbid you from practicing the original law, but is certainly, uh, it is certainly is a, it, it can, it, it's a reminder that the original law is not what saves. There is a new covenant. So, so if an aspect of that law was causing somebody to stumble or fall away or come or come or not come to faith at all, then it could be set aside, right? Hey, Gentiles, right? He's, he's speaking to the Gentiles. Um, I, I, I know, I know that this is hard for you. I know that this is something that, you know, that that's, uh, that, that can be a stumbling block for you. Um, what, what, what would he do? What would you do in that situation, right? Um, come follow Jesus Christ with us. All you have to do is, uh, you know, just just get the get get your men circumcised. And he was realizing that, well, that, that was that was actually kind of a problem. People had a problem with that. It, it, doing some of these Jewish customs, it was it was becoming a problem. So really thinking about is is that, and I, and I can imagine that would have prevented a lot of Gentiles, and that would have been a problem for a lot of the Jews. Like, no, you need to have that. But that was such a big deal for Jewish Christians, especially those who were zealous about the law. Circumcision was a big part of that. It was an important way to communicate to th that someone, especially a, a, a boy, a man, was committed to, to Jesus Christ. So here you have Paul saying, no, you can, you can actually set that aside. So you have these Jews who are saying Paul is causing trouble. Paul is saying that, no, you don't need to do these things. You don't need to follow the law in this way. So this th that's is setting us up to see why why were these Jews so upset and why the elders were so concerned that he was you know that he was making them upset and he was what he was preaching they knew what he was preaching they know what he's saying but these other Jews they could not handle that he was saying you can set aside some of these things Paul was not anti law um, a, a, a lot of a lot of scholars people will say that Paul was Paul is like the Moses of the New Testament, where Moses was given the, 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 the covenant of the law, right, to pass on to the people, and that Paul is like the, he's, he's given the covenant of grace. He's going around to tell the people that the law is not what saves you, it's by grace, and so he's taking this around, um, but he's being misunderstood. He's being misunderstood, and these Jewish Christians are upset about what they perceive he is saying so the Jew, the elders are concerned they figured the jews there in jerusalem would have been so zealous for the law and that they misunderstood what paul was saying so they told him here's what we need you to do to smooth things out they already knew there were jews who were, did not believe in jesus christ and there were even more who, and there were a lot who did so they were going to help paul figure out what uh what what's this all about and what what, what can he do so let's look at the next passage because this is going to tell us um what do they what do they recommend what do they instruct him to do um, to try to be in good standing with the with the Jewish Christians there. So do what we tell you, they said, we have four men who are under a vow. Join these men, go through the rite of purification with them and pay for the shaving of their heads. Thus, all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself observe and guard the law. But as for the Gentiles who have become believers, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men and the next day, having purified himself, he entered the temple with them, making public the completion of the days of purification when the sacrifice would be made for each of them. So what is this all about? Remember, the goal is to help 
Paul make things right with the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. So, so they have these four men. He said, we have these four men who are under what appears to be a Nazarite vow. A Nazarite vow is when someone would commit for an indefinite length of time to abstain from wine or any great products. Um, they would not cut their hair at all for this time. And they would have no contact with corpses or with graves, not even their family members. And this is how they purify themselves, okay? So there were sacrifices that they had to offer to purify themselves for this vow. They had to shave their heads. So the elders instructed Paul to do this with them and to pay any expenses that came up as they were going through these rituals. Uh, some scholars will comment that Paul would have had to purify himself anyway, since he had just come back from being among the Gentiles. So you kind of have to purify yourself from being among Gentiles to, uh, by doing this, you not only is he supporting these four men in uh, their vow, but he's also showing that he is still a Jew himself. He recognizes that he needs to be purified. He understands the importance of purifying himself before re-entering the community. And it was, as we've talked about before, the importance of going into the temple, that was a place of not only of worship, yes, but also that was a place that where you entered into to show that you were part of this community, uh, that you were welcome to this community. That's why, you know, in Jesus' day, uh, you know, the, the, the lepers and people like that, they, they couldn't enter the temple. They were, they were unclean. So, and, and so when they were healed, right, not only was it an opportunity for them to not have this physical ailment, but they were able to actually rejoin the community. And that was why it was so special, so important for them to be healed, not only physically, but restored to their community. So, uh, you know, great. Paul's willing to do that, but, you know, he, he, he needs to purify himself. Uh, so he's, he's showing that he's, he is a, he, he is a good Jew. So you can, you can see that Paul, you know, they cared very deeply about um, what's happening and they, they, want, they want to make sure that they, are, that they are right, okay? So, let's see, sorry, I lost my place here. I wanna make sure that I'm staying on track. So there's this next part that talks about the, the Gentiles, right? So we, we know what he's doing to stay right with the Jews, with the Jewish Christians. Um, but then they also say, and, and by the way, we also have sent a letter uh, to the churches in other places where the Gentile Christians are. <clears throat> well, why is that so important? Because Paul, as I mentioned, has also been going to bat and other apostles have been going to bat for the Gentile believers, and been saying like, look, we don't want to put these heavy laws on these Gentile believers. Can we be flexible? That's really important, church. We, I, I, we, I, I've talked uh, a lot about this in, in past years, and we've talked about a lot about this in leadership. What are the essentials and the non-essentials, right? In the essentials, we need to be firm and we need to be in agreement. But what are the non-essentials where we can be flexible? And that was a big deal because some of the things where they were flexible, as you can see, some of the people thought they were being too flexible and that they shouldn't have been doing that. But Paul wanted to make it easy. Paul did not want to make it hard for Gentiles to become Christians. And so what did they say in this letter? They sent the letter saying, Gentile Christians, you don't need to go through all the strict customs of the law. You don't need even to be circumcised, which again, was a big deal, but they said, these are the things you need to do. Abstain, abstain from eating what has been sacrificed to idols, from, uh, from the blood of sacrifices, eating any blood and what is strangled. Don't eat animals that have been strangled. And there's a lot we could talk about. I'm going to spend time on that, but why that was important in the, in the law in the first place, but don't do that. Don't eat those things and abstain from sexual immorality. Sounds pretty basic, right? You know, don't, and, and, and a lot of these have to do with just, you know, what is either good for your body or, you know, uh, uh, accepting what is, you know, sacrificed to idols. So it's, you know, been, um, been offered to idols already. So we're not, we're not, we're not in, entering into idolatry, right? So don't eat things that are bad for you. Don't enter into idolatry and don't, don't engage in sexual immorality. It sounds pretty basic. And they're telling the, the Gentile Christians, this is just, just make sure that you don't do these things. Otherwise, follow Christ. Follow Christ. We're not going to make it hard for you. 
So I love that they that they have this contrast, and you can tell what the elders are doing here, right? Because it's like they're saying, "Look, Paul, 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 we we know, we know what you're saying, we know what you're doing. Can you just do this to make things right with the Jewish Christians?" And by the way, we sent the letter. Okay, you know, you know, you know the letter we're talking about, right? Don't worry about it. We've got you. Okay, we we know what we know what you've been trying to do. We want to we want to take care. We want to care for the Gentile Christians. We want to care for our Jewish Christian brothers and sisters. So let's let's do this. Um, you know, they're saying if they're Jews, they're zealous about the law, they should be able to live that out as long as they recognize what Paul has been preaching. The law doesn't save them, but only Jesus Christ. If they're Gentiles and the law is a sticking point for them, then just abide by these simple and reasonable rules. Remain faithful to Jesus Christ. So now we see what's happening with, with Paul. So and now, I, now I get to the so what. What does this mean for us? What does this mean for us? Paul has been traveling around for years and the church is growing in large part because of his fearless, relentless, spirit-filled preaching. Have you ever been in a situation, it could be in church or in a family or something, where even after all you've done, hard work you've put in, dues you've paid, sacrifices you've made, ways you've proven your, your, your dependability, have you ever been in a situation where after you've done all that and you feel like somebody still doesn't trust you? Like you still have to prove yourself after everything you've done and somebody still doesn't trust you. You're still not worth someone's vote of confidence. They still doubt you. Maybe you've been, been through this with, with a church situation. Maybe it's been in family, but you, you, you know. You may even feel like this as a parent sometimes. You know, we, my wife and I, Gloria, we give our kids so much and we, we care for them and we, and, and we also even, you know, apologize when we're wrong, you know, and we really try to love our kids. And so it really hurts us sometimes when our kids are like, you know, because we don't give them this one thing. It's like, oh, you know, you're, you're mean. It's like, are you serious? Come on. Oh, you know, dude, nobody loves me. Come on. I don't love you. Like, you don't really, you don't realize by now that I love you after, I, you know, and, and I, you know, we get to that, we get to that point. It's a little sliver of probably how God feels about us sometimes. But yeah, I, 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 I feel that with Paul. It's like he's come back from this amazing missionary journey and thousands of people coming to faith because of his boldness and his commitment to the gospel. And he still has to sit under submission to the elders. He still has to do, he still has to do this for the sake of his Jewish Christian brothers and sisters. But don't you love the humility of Paul? To say like, yeah, okay, I'll do it. Because he did. He did. He, he does. He, he goes through with it. You see at the end of this portion, it says that he goes through it. He does it. Why? For the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Christ and those who would know Christ. He does. He submits himself to these things. He doesn't say, come on. After everything I'm, I've done, you don't know who, what I am and that I, I, am, a, I am a Jew, but I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm a disciple. I'm an apostle. I'm a, I'm a witness. Come on. Thousands of people have, have come to faith because of me. Look, you want to ta talk about, you know, works, deeds done? Like, I've, I've, sh I've proven to you what I've done? Come on. And now you're going to tell me, oh, I got to go shave my head and I have to go through all this stuff and have, you know, to, to prove to what? For what? Because these people, you know, they... So let them believe whatever they want about me. Fine. I don't care. I know who I am. Can you, can you feel that, right? That how you might feel, he might feel that way, but he doesn't. He doesn't, he doesn't do that. For the sake of the Gentiles, he went to bat for them. And for the sake of the Gentiles, he, he gained a bad reputation with the Jews. Because now they think he doesn't care about the law. But now for the sake of the Jewish brothers and sisters, he's willing to go through this to show that, no, I'm not anti-law. And I'm not anti-you. I'm not anti-Jew. I am pro-Jesus Christ and making it possible for people, whatever their background is, to follow Jesus Christ. I'm willing to accommodate. So, yes, I will shave my head. I will go through these purification rites. And, yes, all that, I don't even know how, you know, Paul, whatever money he had at this point, he's like, all right, I'll pay for these guys and their their purification rights sure he did it because he was willing to go through it for the sake of the gospel he doesn't resist he doesn't do that why because ever since he had that encounter on the road to damascus and the scales 
fell from his eyes and he realized that the one he had been persecuting was the one who had found him and loved him and saved him and sent him. His whole life was about preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ because the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ is what saved him. He committed his life to that. <clears throat> Best example of this, I want to look at this passage in 1 Corinthians 9 where he talks about this. Why was, why was Paul so willing to accommodate when he had proven himself already, he didn't need to prove himself anymore. <clears throat> he says, I'm free. I belong to no one. Even though I'm free and I belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone. Why? To win as many as possible. That, that slavery language is, wow, powerful. And it even, it even stings a little bit because, well, I mean, as Americans, we, we, we have a... Uh, a heinous history with slavery right but but that word that slave that but it's not like the kind of slave that like the the master doesn't care anything about you it's like that that idea of a doulos or a, a love like he's he's made himself a slave it's not so like it's not like christ came in and 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 captured him and and beats him down and and doesn't care about his life but he has made himself a slave to everyone he's chosen this life because of what Christ has done for him and because he wants to win as many as possible to Christ. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. Do you see that playing out in this story that we're reading today? To the Jews, I became like a Jew. He's doing it to win the Jews, to show them that, yes, I am, I am, a, I am a follower of Christ. I'm a disciple and I'm an apostle of Christ, but, but I am not anti-law. And so look, look what I'm doing to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. He's following purification rites. He's following rituals. He's following customs. He's purifying himself. Though he is not, he's not under the law, but he doesn't have a problem following these customs of the law because he wants to show the Jews that Christ is for them too. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. So those who don't know anything about circumcision and all these different customs, he, you know, he, he goes to bat for them. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some all things to all people accommodate 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 <clears throat> flexible where 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 there's where flexibility is okay in the essentials be firm in the non-essentials be flexible he's becoming all things to all people go back i mean go read the 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 letters where he talks about you know if if eating this is causing somebody to stumble then stop eating it Right. And don't don't think that you're just, you know, that you were saved, you know, so you can just do whatever you want. Uh, you know, stop, stop doing these things that are causing your brothers and sisters to stumble. Um, flexibility, becoming all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. He knows not everybody's going to believe, not everybody's going to understand what he's doing, even his own Jewish brothers and sisters misunderstanding him. But he knows that some will come to believe, many will come to believe, many already have come to believe, because he's willing to become all things to all people for the sake of the gospel. And I do this for the sake of the gospel that I might may share in its blessings. The blessings of the gospel. What's, what blessings has he been able to receive? He's been beaten, thrown in jail, persecuted. People say all kinds of things. He comes back to Jerusalem and people still talking trash about him. What is the, what is the blessing of the gospel? What is it? The blessing of watching people come to faith, to know Jesus Christ, to have their lives transformed in relationship to Jesus Christ. The blessings of the gospel. Have you ever experienced that? The blessings of the gospel, watching somebody's life be transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Have you experienced that for yourself? Having your life be transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you've experienced that, friends, don't you want that for other people? 
Don't you want that for the people who don't know yet? So just want to give a couple of examples. <clears throat> so you might have heard uh, over the last week or so, there was a Monterey Park police uh, officer who was shot and killed. And now they're finding out that um, this is Officer Solorio. They're finding out that it was likely a, 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 a botched, uh, you know, a, a attempted robbery. They tried to rob him. Maybe he tried to get out and confront him or they, they tried to get out and confront him and he tried to drive away. And while he was backing out of his spot, he saw that they were coming at him and they, they just fired into the car and they killed him. 26 years old. And he was a rookie. He was a rookie uh, uh, in the Monterey Park Police Department. And that picture I showed you, that was, uh, uh, that was Chief, uh, Chief Gordon, Chief Kelly Gordon, who was standing there behind the, uh, the picture. But just, just devastating for the department. Three weeks, Abner, Abner, you know, pointed out, only three weeks on the force. Wasn't doing anything wrong. He's leaving the gym. Um, so Abner had a chance to connect with, uh, Abner had a chance to connect with uh, some of the city officials um, about this. You know, there's, there's somebody, somebody in, the, in the city, a former council member who's kind of stirring up stirring up you know strife and kind of talking bad about the the, the current leaders in the city and uh, and really just trying to draw attention to her maybe her, herself or her own her own views but Abner had a chance to, to talk with one of the city officials about about this and you know offering some encouragement and then they ended up talking about Fred you know our dear brother Fred who passed away who was on the city council um, and 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 really just talking about what what you know what his position means and what the city means and and just just really having a, a beautiful conversation about um, serving the city and and the importance of uh, of of strong leadership and what struck me about this as Abner was telling me is that you know Abner's not a politician I think politicians get a bad rap you know they're 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 known for kind of just saying whatever it takes to get elected and whatever it takes to you know be in the good graces of people uh abner is one of the straightest shooting people that i know you know abner abner is honest he he he's he'll, he'll he'll tell you right he has a he has a prophetic gift right he speaks the truth even when it hurts he speaks the truth even when it's hard to hear hard to say right and i that's one of the things i love about my brother abner you know and he's he's been that in my life at times where he's just said said things and he, he, he brings that when he preaches, you know, he says things that maybe are hard to hear. But what I love about this is that he is, he is not a politician in the sense of, you know, just trying to say whatever he needs to say to, to, you know, to seem nice or to get, get on people's good side. But Abner is there having these conversations with people in power in the city of Monterey Park. Why? For the sake of the gospel. For the sake of the gospel to show that, hey, the church the church in general, but specifically the church uh, river of life, we care. We care about the city. We care about this officer who passed away tragically, who left his family, who had, had a family that he left behind and a force that respected him. We care about this city when, when you suffer. It's not just your problem, but, but we, we suffer with you. We care about the people who are coming into leadership and, and we don't want people who are going to create division and, 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 and strife and, and trying to, to pit people against each other. Like we care about these things. Abner is not a politician, but in those moments, he's becoming all things to all people so that, so that he may win some. Having a converse, a, a in-depth conversation with a, with a city official. And it's beautiful to see that. I respect that. And I think that's a, that's amazing. That's an example that we should follow. So I ask you today, as we as we you know close this time, um, how how might God be calling you to accommodate to to be something? And I and I know that that phrase "all things to all people" has kind of been twisted, and 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 it could be an unhealthy thing, right? Where you feel like you have to please everyone, right? You're people pleaser. You just have to be all things to all people, and and that gets used as a as kind of a negative thing. It's it gets taken out of context. From what, from what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, right? That's not what, what any of us are saying. Just do whatever you can to make everybody happy. I, I, and it, and I, I'll be the first one to say it, and I think many of you can relate to me that that's you. 
that that that's been a problem that you've had to overcome, right? Where you feel like you have to do everything you can to please everybody, and it ends up driving you absolutely insane. Anybody else relate to that? Just me, right? I I, I get I get that. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is not saying you know kill yourself, whatever you know, just to make everybody happy. What he's saying is for the sake of the gospel, when it's called for. Are you willing to lay down your life? Are you willing to lay aside your preferences? Are you willing to lay aside your, um, your, 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 your likes? Are you willing to lay aside convenience? Are you willing to lay aside um, things you have in common? Are you willing to lay aside these things for the sake of the gospel so that this person, so that someone can have a shot at knowing Jesus Christ? And I think we all have those examples. I remember there was a time uh, maybe a year or so ago where I was just getting really burnt, you know, as, as though, as many of you know, my wife and I own a business, <clears throat> playground business. And, and a lot of the families that we serve, um, not only are they, are they wealthy, but they can be very entitled people. Um, they, you know, they come in and any, anytime you're doing service, right? Anytime you're offering a service to people, you know, whether it's a food restaurant, whatever people come in and they're just kind of like, yeah, just give me this. You know, they, they treat you like you're just a little, you know, just a little servant doing whatever they want. And I was getting really burned out with that. I was getting burned out with just serving entitled people. It was getting really frustrating. And I was saying, I don't, I don't, I don't like this. I don't like feeling like I'm just giving and giving to people and they don't even seem to appreciate it. And, and, and then, then they'll go on Yelp and complain about one little thing that they don't like. And I didn't like that. And, and I remember Abner, again, my, my, my prophet brother. Uh, he and I were texting back and forth. And he said, hey, rich entitled people need Jesus too. I don't know if you remember that, Abner. I don't remember that one, but yeah, it's like <laughs> something I'd say. <laughs> but it's true, right? And it's like, accommodate. Can, can you serve people who are entitled and who treat you like, just like, eh, you know, whatever, get me a drink. You know, here's a dollar and just throw it on, just throw it on the desk. Go, me a, go get me a drink, you know, like, like I'm some kind of a cabana boy or something like that. Like, what the heck? Like, I'm a person too, but hey, rich entitled people need, need Jesus too. Can I, can I accommodate myself? I think about, you know, people in our lives. So, so here's, here's, the, here's the, the question that I want to ask you today and just kind of making it practical. Maybe something to help you think about. Who, who, who in your life may God be? And, and don't think of it as like, I need to save a whole you know, city right now. Maybe, maybe just start with one person in your life. Is there someone in your life that's hard to love that needs to see Christ's love lived out through you? Um, is there someone in your life who presents an inconvenience to you, who doesn't know the Lord, who doesn't, who doesn't you know, know Christ yet, but it's, serving them in some kind of way can can display Christ to them and give you an opportunity to, to tell them why, why are you doing this? And, and, and who is, who is this Jesus Christ? Who, is there someone in your life who shares nothing in common with you? You can go out of your way to learn something about them or to, to care about them, even though you feel like I, I don't even, I, I, I find it hard to bring myself to care about this person, but somehow they're in my life. So asking yourself those questions, how can I, how can I be all things to all people? How can I, how can I do something that's out of my way or out of my comfort zone or out of my place of, that I'm familiar with to win as many as possible? So here's the question that I want to ask as we go into um, as we go into breakouts. And let me see. I, I think um, yeah. So so before we go into breakouts, I just want to listen to a song. But but the question that I want you to think about as we're listening to this song is how is God calling you? to continue to lay down your life so that someone else can, can know Jesus Christ. And I add that continue to, because for some of you, it, it, this may be a new thing. You, you may be thinking about this in a new way, but for some of you, I think, and I just knowing some of your stories, I think some of you are already doing this. You're continuing to lay down your life and maybe make sacrifices or do things that are uncomfortable for people in your life who don't know the Lord, but you're doing that so that they can see Christ displayed in you in some way. So some of you may already be doing this and some of you, for some of you, you may not be, but I want to get you to think about how God may be calling you to lay down your life for the sake of 
Jesus Christ and the gospel so that by doing that, some may actually know Jesus Christ. So let's listen to this song and reflect, worship as you do, and uh, let the Lord speak to you and answer. Uh, for me, we, I've made some, you know, uh, relationship with the customers, moms. They're hearing their stories and a you know, few cases of their family drama and have really deep conversation with like individuals. It's crazy. And one became really good friend, came over to our house, you know, and she was here until like 11 p.m. and sharing her childhood and everything, everything that she let out. It's very traumatic, you know, family situation. She's a single mom, but you know, like how she grew up, you know, her relationship with her parents. I was like blown away, you know, and I literally not lay my life but lay my time and you know, my availability for her saying, I'm here. You know, thanks for sharing. I'll do anything to help you. And another mom, married, but I didn't know she, she was my longtime Gloria. member. Gloria, hey, just yeah. so you know, every, everybody came back. So <laughs> we got we got to hear your story though. It was beautiful. Yeah, yeah I thought I thought maybe there was a question. It was like we're all sharing. Spontaneously, that was great, Gloria. I feel inspired. I just want to make sure you knew because I figured you didn't. <laughs> You did great. All right. <laughs> Stop. No, that was good. Yeah. I feel like, man, we could all keep We sharing. wanted to hear the end. <laughs> oh, okay. And then another mom, well, she was my longtime member, you know, um, for my business. And all of a sudden, she was telling me all about her being abused for that time. I didn't know. And because of the relationship we built, you know, I, the, my love on her child, her daughter, she felt comfortable enough to share. So I was able to really step in and I said, I'm here. I know I have resources to help you. And she's actually running away from her husband to China. And that breaks my heart too, that I can't be there for her, you know, like, so I've been texting her and, you know, make sure I said, you know, call me, you know, um, if that happens again, I'm, I'm gonna come and get you, you know? And, and um, I, I say, you know, whatever resources you need, you know, will help you, you know? And like this kind of relationship, how much, you know, how deeply went into like, I, I was able to be really deep part of their lives, you know, and they open up to me. And, you know, I, I think that was amazing and just not laying my life, but laying down my, time and availability for them and be there for them. I think you know, that's, that's been my thing. Thanks for sharing, Gloria. I think it's so beautiful because I, I mean, I've told you this before, but it just seems like, oh, there's the business, but then there's like underneath that, there's just all these relationships and it's a ministry. It's like, yeah, it's really beautiful. Keep We're all sharing. speechless after that. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, Jesse, are we transitioning into announcements? Who's doing announcements today? Yeah, sure. We can do the announcements real quick. Thanks for holding on, everybody. So we have our calendar that we're going to pop up here. Um, this is our last month kind of doing our hybrid schedule. And then in September, we're going to move um, into uh, in person every week at the service club, except for the weekend that we're at the church retreat um, in the mountain. So, uh, also next Sunday, uh, since we weren't able to do it um, earlier, we wanted to do the promotion Sunday. That's where all the kids, like who are moving up in a grade, hopefully, <laughs> you know, we're going to do something uh, in service and, you know, to, to really um, pray for them, celebrate uh, what they're doing. Yeah, just be able to do, celebrate that as a church family. Um, the Monday night football thing is also going to happen. Um, uh, that's going to be at the Ramos's. Um, somebody asked if we're going to have another 
barbecue. I think they like the barbecues, but um, I think we're, we're gonna have to wait until the Monday night football thing. So uh, just a reminder again, life groups are back. We started last week and they will be continuing as we we're continuing this, uh, this theme that we're doing in Acts. Um, thanks for all who were able to help Amy and Anthony move. This is uh, a shot of what they did look like the whole time we were helping them in 90 degree heat. So as you can see, no, <laughs> I couldn't find any sad or like tired or frustrated, um, uh, frustrated pictures of people moving. And I was like, it must be a very happy experience. But, who but yeah, it was great. Pictures. I want to know, I know who takes these pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone who always thinks of moving just thinks of this, right? That's so. Um, yeah, I, 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 we appreciate all those who came out and um, sacrificed. I guess in a way. Uh, but we all survived and we had a wonderful time. I'm sure uh, Johnny might have said, mentioned, you know, he had a good time just praying for them afterwards and chilling with some Starbucks. So, okay, the retreat link is now live. I'm going to email it out to everybody so you have time to do it. Um, it has all the information that you have here, plus a little bit more. I sent a schedule, a sort of sample schedule. We haven't filled it all out yet, but. Um, uh, I know I might have mentioned it was a little lower last week, but I, I had actually used a different formula to calculate it. So it's actually, you know, just a couple dollars more. But as you can see, uh, the first line is for those who are um, going to be there Friday night to Sunday morning. Uh, children under five are free regardless. Okay, they don't count, you know, towards our, our, our minimum of 40 that they require at the, the camp. Um, uh, if, and this has happened before, like if you can only make it on Saturday, please do, okay? And so you're just gonna be paying for meals. Um, but I would say like, yeah, just come on out, do the apple picking, hang out with us, hang out with us for the whole day. Um, and um, and I, basically, you know, we really wanna experience deep community with as many people as possible. So even if you can't stay overnight, um, at least come out for the day. Uh, thank you for those who are, uh, continuing to uh, give um, through checks through Zelle. Uh, like I said, once we're more in person, we'll have like some sort of offering type of uh, box. And um, you know, I had conversations about like how how we can make um, our time of offering and celebration and giving back to the Lord um, more meaningful. So, um, and then finally, uh, the pre-service prayer. The next one will be our last like um, kind of hybrid or just fully Zoom service on the 28th and after service prayer happens right after we say goodbye to each other so if we can all unmute ourselves wave goodbye bless everyone who has 